Welcome back to NJRenewableEnergy.com Install of a Geothermal System Part 2. Now that we've met all inspection requirements and the pressure test is complete, we can now backfill the looping section. Keep in mind, in most cases, you will be required to reseed and fix any vegetation that was destroyed in the process. Okay, let's go down to my basement and begin the inside portion of the geothermal system. The first step is to remove the existing furnace. We will be using the existing ductwork, however we must fabricate new transition pieces to connect the old to the new. Here we've mounted the circulation pump. This unit pumps fluid from the outside loops to the furnace. Here the pipes are being extended from the basement wall to the circulation pump. To complete the connection, hoses are now connected from the circulation pump to the furnace. Once the entire connection is made, all interior pipes are covered with a foam insulation. This is so there is no temperature loss inside the home. The pipes you'll see on the left and right side of the circulation pump are temporary. These pipes then go to this elaborate machine you'll see here. This unit performs two tasks. Initially, it will flush the system of any dirt and debris left over from the initial installation. Next, shown here, it will be used to fill the system with the appropriate amount of environmentally friendly antifreeze. So it's either you kick it here or come up and come across. Here are the new transition pieces I spoke of earlier. This will connect the old portions of the ductwork with the new furnace. When completed, it will look like this. One part of the system you won't see from the outside is the auxiliary heating element. In some portions of the country, New Jersey included, where cold temperatures can reach extreme levels, this is used in the unlikely event here in New Jersey that the system is not capable of generating enough heat on its own. In my climate zone, the unit is expected to function less than 2% of the time. Now power must be run to three separate devices the auxiliary heating element, the blower, and the circulation pump. At the electrical panel, six additional breaker spaces were needed. Two double pole 30 breakers and one double pole 40 breakers were required. It does seem ironic that in order to save energy, you must increase the size of the breakers. However, these devices function more efficiently when using electricity in this manner. Okay, let's talk about how I'm making hot water in my home. This is Water Furnace's new geotank. This specially designed tank will make hot water in three different ways. If need be, the tank can make hot water by electricity. But in most cases, the water furnace itself will generate the heat. Or at the very least, warm the water in the tank enough where the electric portion of the system does not have to work very hard in order to reach maximum temperature. So how does this work? Let's look at the top of the hot water tank first. You'll notice, unlike most hot water heaters, this has four connections on the top. Two of them, the ones marked blue and red, is your standard hot water heater setup, cold intake, hot discharge. The other two connections go directly to the water furnace. Here you'll see the pipes connected to the furnace, known as the de-superheater or hot water assist. These one inch pipes now go over to the hot water heater and connect to the extra connections we mentioned before. In the winter time, 
When the water furnace is taking the heat from the ground and putting it inside the home, it also will take some of that heat and put it inside the hot water heater. In the summertime, when the furnace is attempting to take the heat from the inside of the home and place it into the ground, instead it will place it inside the hot water heater. Water Furnace states in their brochure that in the summer months, when the furnace is running all the time, that hot water is free. Time will tell if that is the case.